to welcome all of you who have joined online um, to our first SIMP uh, webinar. Let me get into the right window here. Um, I'm Dave Martinson from New York Chemical Society, uh, an incoming chair of the Communications and Publications Committee. Uh, Leah McEwen from Cornell University, which is the SIMP secretary. Uh, and Tony Williams uh, from the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, who is the chair elect, uh, have also been involved in uh, helping to bring this series to fruition. Um, the programming committee does a, an excellent job of bringing uh, top quality programming to national meetings, but we know that not all members are able to attend, and so this series of webinars is intended to bring timely discussions to a broader community. We're using, oh, and we would appreciate your feedback. Uh, about this particular webinar and what you think about the series, and you can send that to chair at acssymp.org. Our speaker today is Alex Clark. Uh, he'll be speaking on practical chem informatics workflows with mobile apps. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Auckland and founder of Molecular Materials Informatics. Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about using mobile apps in chemistry to carry out workflow operations. Now if you've been following this field you will have noticed that around, up until around about three years ago there really wasn't much going on in the terms of mobile chemistry apps. There were just a handful of very trivial apps that you could use for chemical operations. But fast forward to now on the other hand there's really a whole ecosystem there and dozens of apps that are designed specifically for some fairly complex chemistry tasks. Now the best place to look for these apps is a website called scimobileapps.com and it's actually a wiki site so if you um, know of any apps that should be listed feel free to add them on there but that's the definitive reference at the moment for finding more information about chemistry and mobile apps. So as I'm going to demonstrate in this talk it's possible to put together some pretty complex cheminformatics workflows just solely by using mobile apps and piecing them together and also using um, supporting cloud-based infrastructure to carry out some of the more complex operations. Uh, my company is called Molecular Materials Informatics and it was founded less than three years ago and the overall goal of the company is to um, advance the tools that are available for mobile apps in combination with cloud-based services so that these tools can be used as viable replacements for desktop um, applications that have traditionally been used in the cheminformatics space. There are a number of apps that are designed to provide reference information to the user based on chemical content. These content consumption apps are relatively straightforward to produce since the user interface tends to be very simple and also these apps tend to provide a lot of value within the limited uh, ramping up the complexity level, we have a number of apps that are designed to make it possible to look up um, chemical content in databases. And so these apps have more complex user interfaces because it's necessary to capture information like structures for query searches and so on. And even though most of the heavy lifting is done on the, on the server side, the app still needs to present the results as well. There are also a number of apps that are designed primarily for visualizing existing data and a lot of these are based on 3D so you can actually render entire proteins on just an iPhone which is, is pretty cool. Um, the use case is not so clear but it certainly is fun. Um, there are a handful of apps that are really designed to create new chemical data and this is really the hardest, one of the hardest things to do from a user interface point of view. Um, these apps can be used to draw molecular structures and reactions and associate these together in collections with scalar data and various higher order markup. Um, there are a number of products out there that claim to be lab notebooks that are suitable for tablet computers. Um, if you dig a little deeper, most of these are actually just regular web apps that have been tested on a tablet. Um, and the handful of NATO native apps are mainly not designed specifically for chemistry. However, given the amount of interest in the idea of having a lab notebook on your iPad, I wouldn't be surprised if some more um, uh, targeted examples appear fairly soon. A number of apps um, have very heavy collaboration and sharing features built into them, and some there are a few apps that are actually designed specifically for that purpose, and uh, we'll be seeing a little bit of those later on. So before I launch into the main workflow example, I just want to take some time to go over the limitations of mobile apps because it really does inform the, um, 
the, the whole subject area. Uh, first of all, the touch screen is, um, it's really not like a mouse and a screen. Um, it, it is analogous in some ways, but really the way you need to design a user interface to make it good is very, very different. It involves a lot of um, different concepts and it's actually a lot harder to produce software. So that's one of the main design constraints when you're porting something to mobile. Uh, modern mobile devices have really quite fast processes now. They're getting they're getting quite impressive. However, you always have to treat CPU resources if, as if they're scarce because uh, these things are often running on battery life. So every time you waste some CPU, um, you're draining the battery and making them come back to a power outlet. Um, these apps have um, a, a different life cycle properties than, than conventional desktop applications. So the operating system tends to kill them off and resurrect them regularly. And this sounds like a, just a minor technical annoyance, but it actually has a profound impact on the way these apps are designed. They have to have loathly. Um, the, the apps tend to be very modular and there's no really good place to put big data sets for them to work with. And so that's, um, that's one of the, the hard limitations for certain kinds of workflows. And functionality also tends to be very network dependent. So it's often dependent, you often need an internet connection to get your work done or access to certain servers. And if, if this ceases to happen, there's obviously a lot of things that you um, can't do. Uh, last but not least is that if you're building native apps, you have a very limited choice of development environments. And this is this is quite difficult to work with. Uh, and you also have to choose between whether to make a native web or a, a native app or a web app. And the latter choice, web apps, are, are severely limited in a lot of ways, especially performance. And so you really have to work with whatever constraints the device vendor has, has um, put on you. However, you'll notice that these uh, limitations, none of them are actually deal breakers. And while most of them take a, a lot of work and ingenuity to overcome, for the most part, they can be overcome. And so my contention is for the, the entire um, objective of this talk is to convince you that um, in cases when you can overcome these, these work around these problems, a mobile device plus cloud services can actually be a full replacement for desktop computing environments. So the workflow that I'm going to go through is based on a collection of using a collection of iOS apps and that so that basically includes anything from Apple's mobile products with some help from cloud hosted web services and each of the steps that I'm going to show on the following slides is based on a currently existing technology so there's nothing um, nothing is just made up and all of it is representative of the state of the art so that this is this represents some of the most complex things you can do right now and um, so while the workflow is based on investigating a possible new tuberculosis drug, this may or may not be uh, similar to the kinds of things that you need to do. Um, but if it isn't, I want you to focus on just the, the level of sophistication that can be achieved with apps. So if, if what you are interested in doing is of a similar sort of difficulty level, then maybe the time is right for you to start getting interested in mobile apps for cheminformatics. So we begin. Um, the background for this workflow is that we've read a paper that um, has uh, suggested that these benzothiazinone scaffolds are good for a, uh, a good starting point for TB inhibitors. So um, based on this information, we fire up the ChemSpider mobile app, uh, which is a free app that accesses the ChemSpider database. And we type in the name of this, the fragment that we're interested in. The app sends off a query to the ChemSpider API which then responds to the list of all of the compounds that match. And so we can see on the right um, the structure and the name of the compound that we've just located. And we can open that within the Safari mobile browser. And uh, on the left, you can see a ChemSpider page, which is rendered in an iPhone form factor. And this, this looks exactly the same as, the, um, as a regular web browsing experience. So you can look at all of the information in ChemSpider. And if you look underneath the structure, there's a little link there that says save. And what this normally does on a regular browser is that lets you download the mol file version of the structure and that'll just save that on your computer. Uh, if you're on a mobile uh, platform, however, it does something slightly different. So on the iOS platform, it compiles a list of all of the apps that have advertised their ability to understand mol files. And it pops up a list of apps. And so on the top right there, one of them is an app called MMDS, and that's short for Mobile Molecular Data Sheet. And it has a long name because it, it has a lot of functionality. So 
at that point it launches this new app MMTS and it hands over the mol file information so that's downloading from the web and pushing it into the app and the app then passes out the structure information and prepends it onto a collection called the scratch sheet which is shown on the main page there so we basically assimilated internet available information onto a mobile app now the next step in the workflow is to actually do something with the structure and we hit the run web service button and that presents a list of available web services that we can use from in this app and for this case in this case we're going to pick the Kibi web service which is a, a database provided by the European Bioinformatics Institute and for the structure we can select something from our scratch sheet so we just pick the uh, one that we imported uh, switch it over to a substructure search and, and run the thing and so this uh, just like for the ChemSpider query, it sends off their request to the web service and then when it's done, it comes back with a set of results. And these results are integrated into the collection that's stored on the app as a new data sheet. So you can see in the bottom half of the right hand screenshot, uh, there's a new data sheet called Kibi Query Substructure and all of the molecules, um, several dozen of them, are based on this scaffold that we searched for since it was a substructure search. So now we've obtained a new collection of information that we can now do things with from the app. Now to work this up, we want to use a different app because we want to do some structure activity analysis. And there's an app, there, there's an app for that. It's called SAR table. And so to, we open it in SAR table um, using the inter-process communication method that we just saw a few slides back. So tap the SAR table button and the SAR table app is launched and it goes into import mode. So the idea of this SAR table app is it represents the collection of compounds in terms of the scaffolds and R groups and reconciles that with activity data. So when we get a, just a plain list of molecules coming in, obviously we don't have the scaffolds yet, so we just see the, the structures and various other information that's associated with them. So the thing to do now is to assign all of the scaffolds. Now this particular slide is probably the most busy one in the entire talk, so um, just bear with me. It, it would take an entire webinar to explain it in any detail. Uh, so then at the very top we have a, a section of the incoming data which has no special assignment. So the first thing to do is to provide the scaffold. And so if you move down to the second panel, um, We've, what we've done here is we've copied the molecule structure onto the clipboard and then selected the scaffold cell and pasted it in. And then we've used the built-in structure editor to um, cut off the cabbage that we don't want and label the um, substituent R groups, which is optional, but it can help. Uh, so we've got the R1, R2, and R3 labeled as part of the scaffold structure there. And the app has now created three more columns for these R group substituents, which are just shown with question marks here because we don't yet know what they are. So the next step is to request an automatic assignment of this um, sca scaffold onto the whole molecule. And the setup, if you follow the arrow to the right, the setup panel is, is saying that it's going to match this scaffold versus this molecule. And it's going to do that by contacting a web service because this um, the substruct, specialized substructure search is not um, implemented on the app itself. It's offloaded. And so once it's done this calculation, it comes back. And so you move down to uh, panel four. And since the scaffold is not degenerate, there's only one result, so it's relatively straightforward. And so you can see the R1, R2, and R3 values have been proposed. And if we just accept those, it takes these results and plugs them back into the, the table of, um, of fragment information. So you can see in the very final panel, number five, we have a fully assigned scaffold R groups and molecule. And you can see the molecule has been redepicted and shown with the, the scaffold highlighted. So that's, um, there's a lot going on here, but it's actually very quick from a user interface point of view. Now the next slide is a bit easier to explain than that one because I could summarize with rinse and repeat. So essentially what we do to assign the entire collection of molecules, several dozen of them, is copy the scaffold, the same scaffold, because we know it's the same because we queried for it, copy the scaffold into all of the rows and then repeat this semi-automated scaffold um, assignment. So it's about three or four taps for every row, which is pretty reasonable for a, a small to medium sized data set. So what we end up with now is a completely assigned scaffold um, collection of data, which was a, a few minutes ago, it was just a, an, an idea that was turned into a query. So now I will reveal that we've uh, also done some more work uh, based on the paper that started this whole train of thought. And we've actually um, entered in a bunch of 
um, structures based on the same scaffold from this paper in Science from 2009. And so we've provided this, the scaffolds and the R groups um, using the data entry capabilities of this app, which make it uh, relatively painless compared to any alternative. And you can see on the right there that the, the um, activity information, uh, the IC50s have been entered in Micromolar. And they're color coded according to a custom scheme which shows green as being the most active and red being inactive. So now we've got these two data sets. One of them has activity data and one of them doesn't. So we can append these to each other. So we create a composite SAR table. And so basically the first half of the molecules have activities color coded as you can see, and the second half just have blank. Now to make use of this, this state of affairs, we can um, use a, a very new feature. So new it actually hasn't been released yet. So this is the closest we're getting to vaporware in this um, workflow. Uh, so we can submit this SAR table, uh, the, the molecules and the activities to a web service which uses the existing data to build a model. And then it predicts possible um, uh, recommended values for the remaining activities. And as you can see in this correlation plot on the, on the right, uh, it's not a particularly good model. Um, so that, that's uh, part of the work in progress that needs to be tidied up there. However, this um, the technology as it exists is good enough to build a, a workflow demo, so we shall proceed. So on the next slide you see on the right, the formerly missing activity values have actually now been um, color-coded using these half-sized, um, half-square wedges. And so the colors give you an indication of, of what kind of activity you should expect for these missing compounds based on the activities of the ones that you already have in there. And obviously, the, the better the data that you put in, the better the model that will come out. Now, we can switch this app over to the matrix view, which is shown on the right. And that allows us to plot two variables against each other. So in this case, it shows R1 versus R2. And so the cells in this matrix that are uh, solid colors represent um, cases where there are molecules that have actual activity data, in some cases more than one. And those with the half, the wedge displays are uh, molecules that have no activity and have predicted information. So a sensible thing to do at this point would be to remember that all of the compounds that we brought in without activity data are all from Kibi, which means they're known compounds. So we can look them up um, online. We can uh, maybe purchase them or at least find out how to make them or ask somebody to send us a uh, sample. And we could bring those into our lab and test them. And then once we've tested them, we can put in the actual activity values back into the SAR table. So the more information you feed in there, the better the prediction or the, the estimation of what um, what you should be looking at from now on, which is you know, the, the basic core ideas of these kinds of <clears throat> structure activity analysis workflows. Um, if we want to go a little bit further out on a limb, though, we could actually pick a um, square that doesn't have any representation on it at all. So we want to venture out into the world of compounds that are maybe not known at all. So if we look in this case, the one that's circled, uh, the square that's circled in red dots, um, that corresponds to R3 is chloro, and which has some um, known positive data associated with it already, and you can see in the column. And uh, R2 equals trifluoromethane, which is, um, well, I had an example that was predicted to be good, so let's, let's roll with that. And so what this gives us is basically this partially functionized um, a molecule possibility on the bottom right there. And so we can leave the, the, the R1 fragment um, open to interpretation. We'll, we'll figure that one out later. <clears throat> so what we um, are interested in doing now is um, figuring out a way to make this new compound. And the best way to do that from a mobile app is to introduce a new app called Sprezy Mobile, which is, can access the Sprezy database from InfoChem. And so um, this particular slide represents a little bit of trial and error, um, but it's all done within the mobile app, so it's, it's genuine. So what we end up doing is, is searching again for this um, core substructure fragment and doing a substructure search on the database. And so we step through a number of results that, that come in from the, the search. And eventually we hit this compound so result number 32 that's shown on the right there. It's a very simple looking compound. Uh, and if we hit the as product button on that, it reissues another search to the Sprezy database, and pulls back a list of all of the reactions that can be used to make this particular product. In this case, there's just one. And looking at the reaction within the app itself, we can see that it looks pretty reasonable. There's nothing, doesn't look like there's anything really fiddly going on there. Um, 
and also the starting materials look like they could easily, one of them could easily be functionalized to add the groups that we want to make our test compound. Um, now, one of the really cool things about this app is that it actually comes with journal references, and some of these are in the form of links, so you can see on the bottom right, if you actually just tap on that hyperlink, you can go straight to the, the journal page that, that will serve you up the PDF file for that a literature article, as long as you have access, of course. Uh, so you can actually read the literature on, on your mobile device, and um, you, know, you, you never actually have to um, go anywhere else to check this out. So we can um, just, uh, for brevity, we've, we've uh, checked so that this uh, synthesis does actually make sense, and we're going to proceed to adapt it to our own purposes. So the next step, we open this reaction data using another app called Yield 101, and that launches this new app and copies over the reaction information. And Yield 101 brings in this data, so you can see on the right there, it's split up the pieces into uh, four individual reactants. The last one's a product, you probably can't see the arrow very clearly. Um, but this is the basic template for the app, so we, we haven't really, we haven't provided any extra information. We've just said, give me this in this app, please. But the next stage is to customize this new scheme um, to make it work for the compound that we want to make. And so there, are, we uh, first have to edit one of the reactants. So we use the built-in structure editor to add the chloro and trifluoromethane substituents, and likewise for the product. And once we've done that, we can enter some of the quantity information that we're planning on using for this reaction. And um, so basically what this Yield 101 app does is it's designed for chemists who don't really like calculators very much. So it uses the chemical structure to derive the molecular weight and then uses the um, in any of the quantity information that it has to obtain molar weight. Then it uses a stoichiometry to cross-correlate that to cross-populate between reactants, and it uses the yield to figure out how much product you should get. So basically, if any kind of interconversion property that um, could be done will be done automatically. So you give it the minimum information that you have, and if all goes well, you'll get um, the result coming out. You, you, you'll get it filled out with all of the experimental information that you need to actually go and do it. Now, at this point, we have a choice, we could take our fancy new iPad over to the lab and risk having nasty things spilled on it, or we can just have the app itself create a PDF file, which is a single page that has all of this and the reaction information, and we can actually print it from the app itself. So in this case, we're not going to bother going paperless, we're just going to take the piece of paper off to the um, dirty lab and scribble all over it, and then when we're done, we pull out a device again and re-enter the information that we collected during the experiment. So um, th this demonstrates some of the things that we can uh, do just, just by ourselves using a collection of apps. Um, a major part of any workflow involves actually sharing the information and uh, making use of it. And so um, what, we, um, what we can do now, for starters, is to take the, um, the, the information from the Yield 101 app and transfer it back to MMTS so it, it gets stored there. From, and from there, we can, we can export the data in a, in a a variety of different ways. And so, for example, uh, one of the things that we can do is to send it out by email to someone of our choice. And these e outgoing emails can include a lot of different types of attachments. Um, they, they always include the raw data, and usually, whenever possible, includes a graphical picture. So whoever receives the email gets to see what exactly is in there. Um, optionally, the uh, attachments can include other form formats, including graphics. So um, you can actually have it generate Microsoft Office documents. So in this case, it includes a Word document that contains an embedded table that has a picture of this particular reaction. And it's very important to note here that um, the, these are actually vector drawings. And so that means if you print out this document or turn it into a PDF or cut and paste it into a manuscript that you're working on, it'll, these diagrams will look continue to look good at any scale or resolution, and which is certainly not the case if you just included in attached bitmaps. I'm sure you all know what happens when you um, put, a, put a bitmap that looks great on the screen into a document and print it out. It's, it's barely legible. So this is basically not that. So from, from within your device, you can actually produce manuscript quality graphics. Um, there are a number of ways to um, share information, in particular by going through this app called Molsync. And that acts as a chemically aware front end for remote repositories like Dropbox, which is the best example. And so 
once you, you can upload and download from, you can actually link it to a Dropbox file. And then once you have that, you, you are free to use all of the Dropbox collaboration and sharing features. So I won't talk in detail about that, but it's an excellent service for um, sharing files with yourself or other people or, or the whole world um, as, as you see fit. Um, if you are working on data that is um, open and non-proprietary, um, you have a number of options for sharing stuff with the entire world. Um, if you're working within a big pharma company, that's probably a little less, little less likely. However, um, we, what we can do is upload the data to a, a web service that uh, st stores the data and returns a URL that um, allows the uh, information to be re-rendered to the user. And one of the best ways to disseminate this kind of information is by pumping, out, pumping it out into Twitter, which can be done from within the app itself. So on the bottom right, there's a snippet from my Twitter feed. I just tweeted out this reaction a few days ago. And so if anyone um, clicks on that link, what they see is the uh, view on the top right, where we can see the reaction has been rendered within the browser. And anyone seeing this can download the, the raw data in a variety of different formats and, and use it in any way that they wish. If you get into the habit of tweeting out information uh, and adding interesting hashtags to your tweets, you might find that they get assimilated into some interesting places. So if somebody were to fire up the Open Drug Discovery Teams app, which is a free app, um, and open up the tuberculosis panel, they would see that the tweet that I put out has been picked up as something relative to TB. And uh, this ODDT app is uh, smart about chemical data, so it actually recognizes and parses out the raw information. It can generate its own thumbnail. And it, it can also and, and view it in more detail. And it can make this information available to other apps. So you can actually integrate it into your app workflow just by using this, this client app that picked, picked up information from Twitter of all places. So that brings us to an end. Um, the workflow that I just ran through, it shows an example of going from uh, reading a paper to having an idea, coming up with a hypothesis, proposing an experiment, and then publishing online. And all, all of this is, um, can be done rel relatively easily. Um, there's, there's nothing really fancy involved. You just use apps that exist already. Um, and these kinds of multi-app workflows tend to involve a, a mixed combination of both creation and consumption of content. And they tend to be very heavy on the use of networked services because a lot of data in particular comes from um, r remotely stored databases that can be searched and queried. And uh, many of them need to use remote computational abilities, even though the apps themselves are really quite powerful and, and you can do a lot of things with them. Um, it, it usually makes sense to do the, the really intense or, or difficult to implement calculations to store those on a, on a remote web service and just have the app leverage those capabilities. Um, one of the things you may have noticed that throughout the workflow, all of the information that we actually dealt with on the apps themselves actually just manage relatively small data sets. So the example I showed you was only a few dozen molecules, um, 40 or 50. And so th this represents a very real limitation of mobile apps at the moment, because although these, the workflow did involve interacting with some huge databases like um, ChemSpider and, and Sprezi and, and the KB database, this was done through a, a very a well-defined, simple process so that whereby the app sends in a small query and it retrieves back a relatively small subset of that data. When it comes to actually working with large data sets, like modifying them or you know, sorting them and all that, stuff like that, um, we need to develop a series, a set of pipelining tools to make this possible from apps. And these really haven't been developed yet, at least not, not in a way that, that apps can make use of them. Uh, so in terms of future work, um, you, will, you should expect to see um, a lot more apps in the future that are coming out to make use of these tools, which have been um, proven to be technologically feasible. Uh, taking these tools and um, building them out for very specific workflows to get um, particular tasks done. Um, and so that, that's the, the, the number of apps that are available to use is going to grow significantly based on that idea. Um, the amount of integration with cloud services is undoubtedly going to go up um, since the, the more complex things you need to do on apps, the more it makes sense to um, build specific services on the back end to, to make that work well. Uh, you should uh, definitely keep an eye on the exploits of the Pistoia Alliance. 
um, because they're currently working on building an app store that has um, specializes in apps for life sciences R&D as an alternative to using the vendor supplied ones like um, the iTunes app store or Google Play. And so that'll be focused just on the kinds of things that, that we do. Um, and uh, as, a, as a second more ambitious project, they're also working on um, coming up with a standardized infrastructure for um, providing back-end support for these apps. And that, that's going to take a little longer to work out, but um, it may partially address these issues that apps have with dealing with big data and making that available to do calculations on. Now, finally, the last bullet point there is uh, my prediction. Um, so what, what I mean by that is that um, full-time professional chem informaticians will always need the, the latest, biggest, fanciest workstation to do their to do their research on. But when it comes to people who are just trying to do science and they're using software to support their efforts, um, I'm predicting that uh, mobile apps are uh, going to become the, the uh, preferred way to run this kind of software. So um, if you're just trying to get some experimental support or write up your lab proceedings or um, interpret a spectrum or whatever, you, you probably don't want to be carrying around a big laptop or going back to your desk. And there's a real opportunity here to design this, these new mobile apps in a way that, that really streamlines the workflow that these people need in order to get their jobs done quickly rather than with a lot of messing around. So I can't tell you how long this will take, of course, and it would be my preference for it to happen as quickly as possible. But um, pharmaceutical industry is, is a bit conservative, so that it, it may take a few years. But uh, it, on the other hand, it may be a little, happen a little more quickly than you think. So you should definitely keep an eye on that. Um, before I uh, wrap up, um, these slides will be available afterwards, uh, hopefully quickly. And uh, so there are a number of papers that we've already published in the literature. So, um, um, of course, because of peer-reviewed publications, they're not quite as cutting edge as um, the examples I've used in this talk. Um, but um, you can read these papers to get a, a background overview. And so finally, um, I would like to thank Tony Williams and Absent here, who was going to do the introduction, but he, his computers all blow up at uh, an inconvenient time. Um, Sean Eakins provided the material for the, the workflow that I presented. He would be here, but he's, he couldn't make it. Um, and thanks to Leah and Martin, who organized this webinar, which um, they tell me is the, the first one that Synth has ever done. So it's a, an honor and a privilege to, to be the first one to do this. And hopefully many others will follow. And thanks to the ACS and Synth in general. Um, and lastly, um, you can find um, a lot of inf more information by following any of the links on the bottom right or following me on Twitter. Um, if you're interested in um, further discussions about any of these apps, feel free to in email us at info at um, And if you want to try out any of the apps that I demonstrated in the workflow, um, not, all of, not all of them are free. And so if you're interested in just taking it for a test drive, just drop me a line and I'll, I'll send you a promotional code because I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about it. And uh, thank you for showing up and listening. I, I hope my audio is still running. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, your your audio was running most of the time. I think it just uh, cut out for a short period of time. But there are a couple of questions. One you already addressed. Uh, would the slides be shared afterwards? And the answer to that is yes. Um, keep a look at the SIMP website, uh, which I'll put back up in a minute. Um, well, we've also recorded it, so we hope to post uh, the presentation on YouTube as well. Um, another question. Um, do you think that the big data limitation of mobile apps is something that will be sorted out in the future? Right. You may have already answered that as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's that really is holding uh, holding back certain kinds of app workflows, and so it remains to be. Uh, we we really need to get together and, and work out a pipelining um, infrastructure for this. Um, one of the the thing is, anybody can build the appropriate backend material, but it's interacting with big data is difficult because you have to arrange access to it. So if you have a server that has some computational and data collection abilities, and you have an app that interfaces with that, um, you, you, you're you really constrained only just as one client app can access this one piece of backend data. It would be much more useful to, to have a general mechanism whereby people could submit, um, 
uh, upload their own algorithms and down upload and download data in order to prepare it. So you really need um, need a more formalized way of, of setting this up. Um, so at the moment, the the big data workflows, as I mentioned, they're limited to very um, straightforward and well-defined um, sequences. So searching a large database for a, for a substructure, that, that's a very well-defined um, API mechanism. And so that kind of thing you can do. But um, yeah, it's uh, working, working out, working with big data is important and it's difficult and we're working on it. Okay, there's no more questions from the audience, but I'll ask my own question. Um, do you find, uh, in, I find that uh, creating an app workflow is kind of cumbersome uh, on a mobile device, uh, either a phone or a, an iPad, for instance, and uh, in the desktop world, it's much easier to jump from one app or one program to another to really have a, a big program that encompasses uh, all of the functionality. Do you find uh, that people are really interested in uh, running through a workflow on a, a small device in an app world, uh, or does it take uh, some sort of commitment and uh, persistence to, to work through some of those uh, limitations and jumping from one app to another and trying to find where you've stored uh, data? I, I would definitely say that it's it's the answer is both of those. Um, the um, the 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 idea of passing data around between a lot of different apps is it, it takes a little bit of getting used to um, because it's different to having you you put a file in one place and then you can on your desktop and you can open it with a number of different applications and usually you don't really end up passing data around all that much. You your applications tend to be monolithic and so. Um, people need to get used to the idea that they're not really, they don't have a, a file that's sitting in a, a single place. They have a more a transient state that can that can go between multiple apps, and it just takes some getting used to. And the apps themselves need to be worked out so that it's as convenient as possible, and uh, you know it's it's obvious that you can use this functionality. So um, it's it's very it's very much in the early adopter phase right now. So I couldn't. I couldn't answer the question as you know, as has it been a success or not. We'll you know, we'll we'll find out over the next couple of years as as more people use it and you know do people just complain and give up or do they stick with it and find that it's that really is solving problems for them. So um, I, I that's not the most definitive answer, but uh, hopefully that that helps. Yeah, I think uh, then an, another question came in, and I'm not sure if this, you already talked about that a little bit, but what are other barriers uh, or limitations? People work habits, people's work habits, data availability, publications availability, et cetera. Um, I, I think it would probably be better, <laughs> better to ask the audience this one, actually. Um, but of course, the, the main one is actually uh, just getting used to the, the the ways that mobile apps work, since they're just they're different from conventional applications, and um, the the first thing to do really is just to demonstrate to people the kinds of things that can actually be done. And so once once you know something that is is possible, you're you're more likely to to try it out and see if that fits um, th than you would if you know if you if you didn't know whether whether there was anything at the end of the road, right? So that that's kind of the purpose of this webinar is just to demonstrate where the state of the art is. And so now that you've you know, you've definitely seen one positive example of, of a chem informatics workflow that, that, that actually involves some fairly complicated components, um, I can assure you that all of those steps are pretty straightforward as long as you have an idea of, of what, what the possibilities are. Um, and so it just remains to, to f figure out if that, that can be adapted to what you need to do specifically, and if not, you know, what, what do us as software vendors have to produce in order to make that happen? Um, and the, the question involves um, data availability. Um, there certainly is a bias towards um, relatively open data collections for and when it comes to bringing data in. Um, so um, you know, databases like ChemSpider and, and KB and, and, and mobile reagents and various others, they're, 
they're not really locked down in proprietary. So um, you know, there there is a there is a, a bias towards open data, and um, so that that removes some of the limitations because for the most part we just we just don't really um, bother creating an interface to to something that most people can't use. Um, and, and certainly for publication availability, of that that's that's definitely a huge problem. Um, if, if somebody doesn't have access to read read a source paper, you know, well, um, that that's just not going to happen. So yeah, that that needs to be worked on. Okay. Well, uh, thanks again, Alex, for uh, doing this first presentation in our synth webinar series. I put up a little bit of information about the division. And uh, again, we would uh, appreciate your feedback. Uh, and uh, thanks to all who uh, joined us 